Thank you for the introduction and um, for inviting me. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Laszlo. Um, and tonight, um, as you can see, I'm going to talk about camouflage. Now, these days, I, I actually work very little on, 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 on visual perception I, I, of humans. I actually work, uh, work on animals. I ended up in the vet school uh, a couple of years ago looking at thermal imaging of calves, um, monitoring behavior of horses, and so on. But um, the sort of work that I'm going to cover here started um, in my PhD work. Um, can anybody recognize what these are? Any ideas? Um, these are um, camouflage uniform patterns from all around the world. Uh, I did my PhD on their cultural evolution. I was interested in how patterns change over time. Um, not about how good they are from a, from a concealing uh, perspective, but what are those factors, um, cultural, uh, foreign policy, and, and so on, that influence uh, their design? So this is like a little evolution of Hungarian camouflage patterns as a country where I'm, I'm originally from. So to give you a, a, a brief outline of what we, I'm going to talk about today regarding camouflage, uh, I'm going to give a, a review on the forms of protective coloration. Then we're going to talk about, that's mostly going to be about animals. Um, then we're going to move on to humans and the brief history of camouflage, uh, particularly what happened in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, hiding in the eye of the beholder, which is about why we should consider whatever we design, whatever we build, whatever we look at in, in, in nature and in, in, in urban settings, we should always consider um, our, our observers. So, forms of protective coloration. Um, there's like a, a, a cascade of different strategies uh, that mainly biologists have built up in the past uh, century or two. Uh, and here is like just three um, main themes from it. So, re remember when animals use camouflage, the idea is not to be not, not be detected, but they, they want to survive. So the idea is, the goal is how to survive. So the first layer of that is people usually say, don't actually be there, okay? Uh, but if you're actually there, don't get detected. Uh, if you are get detected, uh, well, don't get recognized as something that's a, that's a tasty food item. And if you do get recognized as something that could be potentially edible, but well, don't get selected, make sure that in that case you look um, you, you look like you have poison, uh, or you look like something that's, uh, that's uh, threatening. So just going to quickly go through of those. So the first technique is uh, the strategy that got described is background matching. Can you see the animal here? It's actually a fairly large screen, so it might be, not, it might be actually fairly easy. Who can see the bird? I'll give you, give you that away. That's, we're talking about a bird. I can't see any of you. Uh, what, nobody? Okay, it's a bit of a cheating because it's actually, um, oh, where is my mouth? Uh, there, it's over here. It's a, it's a plover chick, it's a, it's a small bird. Okay, it's a bit of a cheating because it's occluded. Here you are, this is not occluded, this is in plain sight. You're looking for a frog. Haha. <laughs> So the froggy is over here. You can see the two hind legs are here, the back legs. Uh, here is the nose, and here are the two, the two eyes. So that's a sort of, you match, the, you match your background. So you look at the image, you don't even recognize that something interesting is there, OK? Um, you are, you're, you're basically invisible. You just blend into the background. Um, another technique that got described um, by Hugh Cott, uh, who was a, a biologist, camouflage scientist uh, in the 1930s, 1940s, um, is disruptive coloration. So if you have highly contrasting colors, you can start to uh, break up uh, your form. So the, those examples, Cod's drawings on the left. And if you think of a um, stripy animal, well, you know, tiger is probably a, a good example that uh, most, of us, most of us would uh, think it would come to, come to our mind. Uh, we'll get back to tigers in a, in a little bit. So here's another example. So this is coincident disruptive coloration. So when the frog takes a particular uh, body position, then these stripes align um, and it destroys the shape of a frog. So you might see that something is there, um, but you don't recognize it as a frog. 
if you are someone who is interested in frogs. Now, how do, how do biologists do research on this? Because it's, okay, great, this is something that, you know, Darwin and um, um, Vallis went out in the 19th century uh, to South America primarily and described a lot of interesting species. But how do we actually do research on these? So here is one of the sort of groundbreaking studies that happened in 2005 uh, done by people in Bristol. Um, what you do, you take a cardboard, you cut out a shape, typically a triangle, you, you put patterns on it with a pen or you print it as such, you stick a dead mealworm to it and you stick it up in the forest. Um, and you come back every once in a while and you look at how uh, many of the mealworms are gone given the condition that you have. So you have highly contrasting patterns, sorry I'm pointing nowhere, um, so you have highly contrasting patterns uh, that break the outline, you have highly contrasting patterns that don't break the outline, you have some control conditions when there is nothing and you have light contrast. And um, I'm just, this is, this is a, what's called a survival plot and what it basically tells us, if you are disrupting your shape, uh, the mealworm actually survives um, longer. All right, so another um, famous animal when it comes to stripes is, uh, is zebras. And for a long time, zebras were thought that actually, well, they break, up the, they break up the shape, the black and white. So when you look at a herd of zebras, if you're a lion, it's very difficult to select um, an individual zebra. Now, there's actually little evidence that that happens. Uh, lions are actually, they're quite blind when it comes to visual acuity. They actually see blurred, so blurred images uh, compared to us. So a zebra looks more gray to them. Well, recent re research is showing um, they were dressing up horses in these various zebra patterns. Zebras are horrendous to work with, um, so they're using horses. Um, is it's, the stripes are really good against flies. Flies, uh, horse flies, find it very difficult to land on zebras um, when uh, on the stripy parts uh, of zebras. So it's okay. It's, sh it's shifting every 10, 20 years. What zebras are about is one of the holy grails of camouflage. Currently, we are at the fly theory. Um, Okay, another technique. Now you are detected, you can see, um, but you're not recognized. So this is actually a butterfly. Um, it's called a dead leaf butterfly, you can guess why. Um, you would look at this uh, among, um, among a leaf litter and you would really struggle to identify this as, as, as something edible, as, as something that you would be interested in, for example, as a bird. So this is something we call masquerade um, in, in the realms of um, camouflage science. It just basically means that if you're a predator and you eat the, the butterflies, if you detect it, you don't have an effect on the population of leaves. So you're not really affecting rocks or leaves. Um, so these, these animals can use these techniques without effectively being harmed to anything else. The reason I'm saying that is because there are also mimicry, the different types of mimicry. So this is called the Batesian mimicry. Uh, on, the, on the left, you see a hoverfly, which look like a wasp, but it's not, there's, there's no stinger. It's a very unprotected animal. Uh, but because it looks like a wasp, uh, birds might decide not to go for it. Now, because of that, the, the wasps might end up with being attacked a little bit more because the birds think, oh, okay, I just had this wasp-looking thing that was actually a hoverfly. Um, it tasted nice, so I might as well try the wasp. Um, another version is when both of you are protected. So our favorite honeybee and, and the wasp, they look similar, uh, yellow and black stripes. So they actually, they actually strengthen each other's uh, warning color uh, capability. Okay, what if you are um, detected? What if you are uh, recognized? Well, then you can actually signal to your um, predators that you're really not tasty. So here is a bug. Unfortunately, I don't know what this bug is. I took a picture of it in my, my parents' garden, um, but it, it looks, it looks very, very visible. Um, the red and, and black stripes, um, typically red coloration in nature is something that signals, don't eat me, I'm, I'm poisonous. So this is a cinnabar moth. Uh, we have a lot of them in, in the UK. You can come across them. They're really, really, really beautiful. And they, you know, they signal that um, they, they contain um, poison. Now when they're young, they actually look like this. This is a caterpillar of the cinna cinnabar moth. Um, and when you are up close and you look at these yellow and black stripes, 
along the VASP uh, analogy. So yellow and black stripes are usually mean danger in nature. So if you are up close, you see like, oh, okay, wow, um, this, this, could be, this could be nasty. I don't want to go for it. However, when you are far away, and this is something, uh, we did some research, this was research in, in Bristol, um, Jim Barnett and, and, and Ines Cuthill, that if you're actually far away, these black and uh, brown stripes start to blend together. And this was an idea that you can actually have multi-layered defenses when it comes to um, protective coloration. So if you're, from, if you're looking at from far, I just basically blurred it to imitate uh, looking at from far, um, the caterpillar becomes brown. Right? You mix yellow and black, no surprise. And if you, the, the bird flies closer and, say, detects the, um, that it's always oh, a caterpillar, there's still another layer of defense, which is basically telling, I'm yellow and black, I have poison, so don't, don't come for me. So just to give you, just to go back to the, the, the dead leaf butterfly, um, it looks very convincing. And when you go close to this animal and this animal thinks that, oh, okay, I've been detected, this is how the actual upper wings look like. So it opens up, and you have this very striking pattern. Um, you see uh, a myriads of colors. Um, you see eye spots. And this is also an actively researched field, like what eye spots actually do. Is this something that can deter predators? Uh, nobody likes eyes um, in nature. Nobody likes to be looked at. And, and these, these, these spots actually create the illusion um, that something is um, staring at you. But it's not always visible. So it's the same like with the dead leaf uh, butterfly. You only get this display when you're, when you're up close. Um, here is something that a lot of people might not think that could work as camouflage. My colleagues are working on this. Uh, there is a camouflage lab in, in Bristol. Uh, it's like a lab between biology and psychology. Um, and jewel beetles. So iridescence could actually function as a form of protective coloration. Um, and iridescence is uh, basically the color, uh, it's, a, it's a property of the surface, and the color of the of this surface changes with, with the looking angle. So you can, these are all the same, you can, you can see on the right side, um, but if you're looking at it at a low angle, you see purple and blue, and if you're looking at it right on, uh, you see green. And, and uh, we were able to show that actually these, uh, uh, these colors are camouflaged compared to um, just basic green or, or a matte uh, colors of the exact same colors. All right, so that's a bit about animals. Um, what about us? Um, so you might have heard of Liu Bolin. Um, he's this uh, incredible artist who creates these uh, images where he stands in front of uh, some kind of uh, uh, background of, of many objects, like a, a supermarket uh, setting, or in this case, I guess, just all the CRT screens. So if you haven't seen him, he's standing right here. So humans use camouflage, um, camouflage as well. Um, and I was just uh, talking to Will just before this, this lecture, and we were talking about uh, massive warehouses uh, colored in interesting colors. So this is uh, the Morrison's warehouse uh, down on the M5 near, near Bridgewater. And when you drive past it, it's, it's, a very, it's actually a pretty pleasant sight. Um, it nicely blends into the, the, surrounding, the surrounding forest. So this is something that you, know, you could argue this is background matching people use. Um, these towers in Paris, um, they've been colored to, to have this sort of disruptive effect. Um, and also masquerades, so mimicry and so on is used um, in human settings as well, uh, architectural settings. So this is an antenna that's been camouflaged as a, um, as, as a tree. Uh, but okay, where does it all started? So just to give you a, a little bit of history uh, of, of, of camouflage. So, as you can probably guess, I mean, camouflage is something that's uh, important for the military and, and has its roots in, 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 in military uh, settings. So, before the, the advent of firearms, when people wanted to fight with each other and they had big battles, they had to come up close. So, there was no point in, in hiding yourself. Actually, it was considered uh, unchivalrous, I think it's, it's a word, like not very decent to, uh, to do that. Um, so before the 20th century, some of the uniforms of the French army, you can see the entire rainbow here. So this is like, you know, the same country, units all wearing 
very, very, very different colors. So when guns came around, uh, it wasn't such a good idea to look like a, well, like a, a red target, for example, very easy to, very easy to hit. So the idea of um, camouflage clothing started to come into play. Now, the, one of the earliest mentionings, actually, goes back to the 16th century by a, a Scottish historian, George Buchanan, who claimed that certain types of tartan, um, certain types of highland tartan, actually imitates the leaves of the heather. So this was used by uh, rangers up on the highlands against poachers. Um, so that's sort of the, the legend. So the first sort of camouflage clothing in, in the military setting is, is claimed to be khaki. It's the end of 19th century, started to be used uh, by uh, the British Empire. A khaki means um, uh, dusty in, um, in, in, in Persian, I think. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, what, that's how exactly how it looks like. It looks like dusty clothing. You can make khaki, they made it with a tea, actually. They put white clothing into, into tea and then they got this sort of color. Um, okay, legend decides where was the first proper research of, uh, of camouflage, and the earliest I could go back is 1800 by a, by a British uh, lieutenant colonel called Charles Hamilton Smith. And what he, what he asked is, okay, if I have three colors, the very popular red color of the British Army, um, green um, that is used by, I don't know, hunters, and gray that is used by uh, Prussia, uh, what, what are, which are the colors that, uh, that, that offer the, the best concealment? And basically, they created these targets and asked uh, sharpshooters to shoot at them um, and, um, and find them and shoot them. So this was the actual research that six participants, he called them educated Jaegers. So Jaeger is a hunter in, in German. It was very, very detailed, whatever, 108 shots at each, whatever yards and so on. Uh, and they lost all the data. So they had to reconstruct, uh, I mean, it, actually the research was written up 60 years later when Charles Hamilton Smith was already dead, dead. so it was, it was quite a crazy story. But the recollection was that twice as many hits were done on red than gray, and green in the middle. So gray is a great color, green is not so, not so bad, um, don't be red. Up till the beginning of the, the, second, uh, the First World War, the British Army was actually wearing a lot of red. They were switching over to khaki, but they were really, really, certainly in 1800, they were wearing um, uh, um, a red. So yeah, okay, um, we got to the, the First World War, which was um, the big explosion of camouflage everywhere. I mean, we, we're talking about uh, aerial reconnaissance, we're talking about, you know, binoculars became, uh, Standard, standard issue, uh, firearms, um, they had higher and higher range. So what happened is, uh, the French started something called Section de Camouflage, um, where they hired all the artists that could get their hands on. So I just wrote ETC here, but if you look at early 19th century, um, Impressionist, Expressionist, uh, Cubist, Cubist in particular, uh, they were all there. Um, in, in, this, um, in this group. It was run by a, um, a painter called uh, Descebola. Um, and one of their inventions was this uh, fake observation post that looked like a tree, but actually you could go in and look um, over the battlefield. Um, and they started to camouflage everything. So this is some drawings by André Mar, um, a cubist interpretation of, uh, of, of a gun. Um, the other side was doing this as well. So in Germany, uh, they invented aircraft camouflage, Paul Clay, Franz Marc, uh, uh, artists, painters. Um, one of the things with the looking pictures at from something like the First World War, they're often in black and white. So it's very difficult to appreciate how colorful things actually were. So here is a, here's a picture of this plane from a, from a museum. So it's, it's actually, they were using quite a lot of colors to hide the... Uh, um, hide various different uh, machines of, um, of war. And this is kind of where my sort of PhD started as well. Just gonna briefly cover this, what happened in the First World War. So these are the, these are the Germans. They were wearing something called Feldgrau, which means field gray. As established 100 years earlier, that was actually a pretty good color. Uh, Britain swapped to khaki. And the French in the beginning were adamant that they have to wear blue. Um, sky blue uh, or this dark blue mixed with red. Um, and 
it took them quite a few months, if not, I think, over a year to realize that this is a really, really, really horrible idea. And a lot of deaths were, um, were associated with, with not wearing the, the sort of uh, right clothing. After that, they swapped to uh, more earthly colors as well. Okay, so when, let's, let's look at sort of, uh, if, you, if you don't want to hide, if you want to make something very, very obvious. So this is an inflatable tank um, from um, the, the Second World War. And this is similar to sort of like akin to warning coloration, I guess, in nature, that you want to you wanna actually advertise something. So in this picture, what you see is, is tanks, and not a single of them is actually real. But it's a very, very convincing... I mean, these are inflatable, right? It's like four, four men can actually lift them. Uh, but they did a lot of work with bulldozers and so on. So when you would look at it from above, it just looks like a scene where, you know, tanks, tanks are gathering. Um, here is another one, um, another story from, from America. So in the beginning of the Second World War, America didn't know that Germany and Japan actually ca cannot come over um, the Atlantic and the Pacific, Pacific Ocean, respectively. So this is um, the Lockheed Aircraft uh, factory in Burbank, California. And that's how it looked like. So you look at it, it's a fairly big thing. And it's fairly easy to recognize. So they were concerned that you know, it will be easily to spot from air. So this is the same, same factory. So they created this um, artificial field all over it uh, with various, I guess, tapestry and uh, canvases and so on. And they even built fake houses. So none of this is real. This is, this is the, I mean, you can see a little bit here. Like, there is a factory, an aircraft factory, one of the biggest at the time um, uh, under this. Uh, and they were involving, obviously, artists in this, uh, architects, designers, and so on. Um, so another Laszlo, um, far more famous than I am, uh, Moholy Nagy, who was working in Chicago. He's really famous for Bauhaus, as you, as you probably know. Um, um, they were camouflaging Chicago. Uh, they were trying to camouflage the entire sort of city. This is one picture I could find. Um, Camopedia, oh, you, we, can't, we can't really see down here. Um, the Camopedia is an excellent website um, run by uh, Roy Behrens. He's a professor, I think he's a designer in North, North Iowa, and he published a lot of books on, on, on camouflage, really, really interesting books um, of, of all kinds, really, really recommend him. And he runs this uh, blog and he posted this picture not uh, fairly recently, I think. Uh, it's, it's incredible, it's like you see this huge building um, and it's, it's breaking up shapes, sort of disrupted coloration. Okay, so another um, interesting story from the beginning in the first, that begins in the First World War that I haven't touched on um, is dazzle camouflage. Um, so the idea here is, the, the question was for the Navy, the British Navy, that how to hide the battleship. It's a fairly big beast uh, that is usually seen against nothing. Um, so um, Norman Wilkinson had an idea that instead of actually hiding them, let's look at going back to this idea of you, you don't want to get killed if you're in nature, you don't want to be eaten. It, it's not the problem of not being seen. You want to be able to, to make sure the predator cannot get you. And in, in, in the, pred these, the predators of these ships were um, uh, submarines. So the idea was that how can we come up with something that would make um, submarine captains to estimate the course and speed of the ship. Okay, they can see it, fine. If they get too close, then the ship would spot them and then the submarine is in trouble. So it's really from a distance that what patterns can we come up with that would make it difficult to uh, aim a torpedo at these ships. And again, these beasts were actually fairly colorful. So black and white was the most typical color, but there was a lot of, lot of color involved as well. Painters, vorticist painters, uh, Edward Wadsworth, for example, um, were involved um, in, in painting these ships. And in recent years, uh, some of my colleagues in Bristol actually did, um, did, uh, did research whether this works or not. I mean, the, the, the thing was, this is all anecdotal whether it works, and there's not a lot of research done. I mean, the Navy claims it worked, but nobody has really replicated it since. I, I know of a study that uh, was done in, in Scotland uh, by, by a colleague of mine working on camouflage, 
Um, but it's not published yet. But I think he was able to show, he was using some simulations of uh, periscopes that this actually works. But this research in Bristol was basically to look at how does, uh, how does speed perception is disturbed given your uh, patterns. It was a really, really simple psychophysics study where you had these rectangles and they were moved across the screen and you have to click on them. And basically what they were able to show, if they go fast enough, then if you're a stripey, it's difficult to click on you. But it has to go really fast, much faster than a ship, ship can go. So this, this speed thing is a little bit tricky uh, to prove, but here are some images that I think really show that it works when it comes to estimate the course of the ship, which is really important when you wanna shoot something at it. Is it coming towards you or is it going away? So you can see on the right that it's actually very Simple to see that the ship is coming at you, but here, well, I, ca I cannot tell. I cannot tell. So this was, um, th this was a, a really interesting insight that, that Wilkinson had, have, uh, that what you really need to consider is your observer. You need to consider how does the submarine captain see the ship? not how anybody else see the ship in harbor. Um, and this is an idea I would, um, I would like to explore a little bit. And now we get to the, the third section of hiding in the eye of the, the beholder. It's, uh, it's the first time I think I use the word beholder. Um, I don't know if there are anybody who's not first language is English in the, in the, in the audience. Okay, so when, do you know, how did you learn what a beholder is? Right, okay. So if you play Dungeons and Dragons when you, were, when you were young, the Beholder is actually a monster um, that has like many eyes and does, does various magic. So the only exam I nearly ever failed at university is when there was a, the exam question was that hiding in the eye, the beauty is in the eye of the Beholder. And I was like, why is this Beholder, um, this monster, um, to do anything, to do anything with this question? Sorry, sorry about that, it's just me uh, ranting a little bit on, on the word Beholder. Anyway. Let's move on. Um, let's get back to tigers. Um, now, who can spot the tiger? Pro pro probably most of you can see that there is a tiger, a tiger on the image. And isn't it just weird that um, the, the, the tiger who is, uses camouflage is an ambush predator. A tiger cannot outrun uh, a deer. Uh, it has to ambush. Has this really bright orange brown color and if you look at it against green vegetation and tigers do live in jungles, at least some of them, um, it's, it's a very, very easy color to spot. It's very, very um, un unnatural when we look at it. However, I would just here want to go back on this idea that we really need to consider who is the tiger trying to hide against. The tiger is not, was not evolved to hide from, from us humans. It was actually evolved to hide from Samber deer and wild hogs, which is more than 50% um, of its diet. So, what I'm going to need now is, is a volunteer who is happy to wear uh, a pair of glasses for me when I ask him, her, to, to do that. Would anybody like to be vol a volunteer and describe what you see in the image? Okay. There you go. Um, can I ask your name? It could be, Naya. doesn't have to be a real name, just Naya. any name. Naya. Niall. Naya. Naya, okay, thank you. So, can you please put on the glasses, and your task is to tell me where the tiger is, and please don't take them off. Can you see the tiger? No. Can anybody else see the tiger? Yeah. yeah, so take the glasses off. All right, so what those glasses do, I mean, the tiger is obviously here. What, the, what those tigers, uh, tigers um, glasses do, um, they, they render you uh, into red-green colorblind. Um, it gives you red-green colorblind vision. And that's how Naya saw the, the tiger. Is that right? If you put the glasses on, it, it doesn't change much. Right, yeah? So... Why is, why is this interesting? Um, well, because deer and wild hogs, they're colorblind. Most mammals that you come across, um, pigs, horses, dogs, cats, almost anything except uh, most monkeys, maybe 
60-70% of monkeys. They have full color vision like us, so they, have a, they are called trichromats. They have three sensors in their eyes that pick up color. Um, and the cetaceans, so dolphins, whales, they are proper color blind, uh, black and white. But what was not actually known till the 1960s is that actually most mammals are not colorblind in the sense it's black and white. They just can't see the difference between uh, green um, and, um, and red. So here's the, here's the image of, uh, of the tiger again when you can see it. And this is this, is this sort of simulation of how it looks to colorblind. So actually for a, for a deer, um, green and red doesn't have a meaning. It's, it's the same color. It's, they, they see it as the same color. So here is the spectrum of the colors we see as humans. And if you put on the glasses, can you just describe what you see? What happened to these? What happens to these colors? Um, yeah. So it's fair to see that fair to say that it's um, it's mainly yellow and blue that you can see. Yeah. yeah so that's how it looks to uh, um, a red green um, dichromat um, uh, ob ob observer. So all of those colors um, are lost. OK, just very little bit of biology here. So the reason is, is that we have um, three sensors, three cones, we call them in our eyes. And that's their sensitivity. So the, the color that you see here is where your cones are most sensitive. So you have two cones here. One is sensitive in the green, one is in the red region. And this difference here, this non -over, the bit where they don't overlap, gives you the ability to tell the difference between the orange tiger and the green background. Now, if you're a deer, you actually only have two of these cones. So this, there is not, there's nothing that can tell you that there is a difference between uh, green, um, green and red. Now, vision really differs across... Um, across the animal kingdom. If you're a honeybee, you actually see pretty well in the ultraviolet. So you are actually trichromat if you're a bee. You're not so good with red, but you're pretty good with ultraviolet. And that's the reason for that is that while I only see these, color, these uh, flowers as yellow, uh, the bee sees extra patterns on it that the flowers um, have developed. Um, if you're a fish, most fish are trichromats. There's a bit of variance, but um, as you can probably guess they're mostly interested in blue, not much in red. Red attenuates very quickly in water as you, as you get deeper. Now, birds, are, um, birds actually see more colors. Uh, they can see UV and they can see all colors uh, pretty well. Um, so it's all, it's, all, it's all different. So now you might ask, OK, well, fair enough. Uh, but why is the tiger not green then, like proper green? Because that would work against humans as well. And the, and the reason for that, there's a bit of biochemistry here. Uh, there are melanins that create color in, in hair, in, in mammalian hair, and it's just limited. Uh, the, those melanins, eumelanin and pheomelanin, they're called, um, limit you to be basically either a shade of gray or very light yellow to sort of dark orangey or orangey colors. Um, but, I mean, it works. I mean, you, you don't have to be green because most of your predators um, don't see color that well. Um, and it's biochemi biochemically impossible to become green. So green stuff like, you know, birds, like a, a mallard, for example, I don't recommend you doing that. But if you go and catch a mallard in the park, a male mallard, and you tear the, the, the green feather out from its head, the feather is actually not green. There is no pigment in it that makes it green. It's, it's a structural color. It's the structures that um, bounce back the, the green light um, more than others. It's, it's, it's not to do with pigment. It's a if you actually rustle up the, the feather, that color will properly go. OK, well, here's another example. I just found this bunny the other day, um, not far from Bristol. I was like, wow, that is a very red rabbit. Um, it's actually pretty much the same color as grass. Yeah. Now, OK, uh, what are the limits of all of this? Um, the, the sort of craziest animal that I can think of is called the giant Indian squirrel. And that looks a little bit like a rainbow. But I think there are some other, other effects here. Um, that it, these, this is like a contrast effect that the colors actually emphasize each other. But if you would look at it very closely, you would find it's, ah, it's just a little bit blue, which is possible biochemically. And it's like literally at the end of the other color is the end of this spectrum that you can create with, uh, with red and, and, and uh, 
sort of a little bit purplish, um, and, and so on. Anyway, I just thought this is a, this is a pretty crazy example. It's been far more colorful than the squirrels we have in, uh, we have in the UK. Okay, back to the, back to the experiment. I um, just want to show some um, monkeys. So could you, put, could you please put the, uh, the glasses on? And tell me what color is the little monkey? Yeah, so if you take the glasses off. So it's this very, very um, bright orange. Um, these are um, leaf monkeys, dusky leaf monkeys. They live in um, South Asia. And what is very interesting here, these monkeys are, they can see color really well. They see colors like us. But what is really interesting um, is adults are this dark brown and the little ones are um, this very shocking orange. And if you are a, a dichromat, you actually see the little monkeys as such. And actually, now both monkeys look fairly well camouflaged. So this is all speculation I'm going to tell you. There is no actually research yet underpinning this. But well, I think that what could be happening here is that the monkeys can exploit the fact that they can see orange pretty well. So they can tell a, a young monkey apart from an adult monkey very easily. So, you know, the young monkey can get away with more trouble. Um, it's, it's not... Um, it's, it's, it shouldn't be considered an adult yet, uh, and so on. Um, so they can see each other pretty well. They can use this for social signaling. But if you're a dichromat predator, like a leopard would be, um, you're actually pretty well, well camouflaged. Okay, the theory breaks down a little bit with birds because eagles also eat monkeys. Um, so I don't know um, how the orange work against birds, um, but we'll, we'll find out, hopefully. There is there some research done on that. Now, the other thing I talked about cats is um, what we also need to consider is visual acuity. We humans and bird of prey, they have, we have really, really good visual acuity. We, have, we, have, we can see stuff in detail pretty well. Most of other things cannot. So cats, for example, um, the distance you would see these monkeys from, they would see a blurred image like this. It's, just, it's much harder for them um, to spot detail than for us. Okay. Let's just um, go back a little bit to, to us, us humans. What about, what about us? Um, so in some uh, American states now, um, it's compulsory to wear this very bright orange clothing when you're hunting because your fellow hunters can spot you. Um, but if you're a deer, it doesn't matter. You look, you look green. But it's, th there are... There are many cases of uh, color blindness or, or trouble with uh, rec recognizing colors uh, in humans, actually. 8% um, of males um, have a form of, uh, of color blindness. Not as severe as necessarily what you see here. It's, that's about 1% uh, that is affected. And the reason there is a big difference between um, uh, males and females is because it's something to do with genetics. It's the, the, the X chromosome uh, is involved with uh, developing uh, with color vision. And because you have double X chromosomes as a female, the likelihood of being affected by color blindness uh, is like one in 200. So that's like half a percent. Uh, if you're a male, only one X chromosome is actually 8% uh, that, that you have some troubles. So you probably come across the, oh, should have asked you to tell me the number, I forgot. But you can, but you can, you can see the number, I think, pretty well. And if you put the glasses on, you see that that number 74 disappears completely. So that's how you see those with the glasses. After, after the talk, uh, obviously everybody is welcome to, to try them. They're, they're, they're pretty, pretty nice. Um, so going back a bit with history, and this is my, my very poor attempt to simulate something. Um, in the Second World War, they hired dichromat males uh, in aerial reconnaissance because the idea was that when you have a building um, that is colored brown and green against a similarly colored background. If you are a dichromat, you, and, and the edges are broken a bit, if you're a dichromat, uh, the, these colors sort of blend together and you are much easier to recognize uh, shapes. I, I tried to do this yesterday. It's a very, very poor attempt, but I, I, have, I haven't found all aerial photography from the Second World War is obviously black and white, um, so I struggled, struggled with that, but I, I, hopefully you get the idea. Okay, to, to finish up, I'm just going to give you two examples of the current research that we do, um, do in Bristol. So 
this is something to do with, with, with camouflage. So this is um, using um, deep neural networks, so like sort of the latest step in, in artificial intelligence. Um, to study the evolution of camouflage patterns and also study the evolution of vision. So the idea here is that you have two um, actors, um, two entities that are playing a game. So you have a prey that is trying to evolve camouflage and it starts from being random, random color. And you have somebody uh, who is a predator. This is also represented by an algorithm that is trying to evolve um, vision. And the task of the, uh, the, task of the predator is, is to tell apart an empty scene from a scene when the target is there. And the, uh, the, the goal of the prey is to make sure that the discriminator, the predator, thinks that this image is empty. So you can end up with this evolutionary um, game with software. It actually works. Um, I mean, okay, this is just an illustration. That what I'm trying to say is that over time, you evolve better vision and you evolve better camouflage because you're in this evolutionary arms race. This is exactly what we were able to do with our famous triangles because that's what people do camouflage research on. Um, so from noise, um, this, uh, this is just basically rainbow random pixels. Over time, uh, it evolves to have a, have a camouflage pattern. Uh, it's just sort of like a proof of concept that you can you spot the we're actually be able to show that over time these, these patterns become better and better and better. So here is one, sort of the easy one. Here is another one. And the third one, not even I know where it is. Hold on. Ah, okay, it's, uh, the reason for that is down, it's down here somewhere. I think there is something in the screen here. It's like a double reflection. But anyway, just, just believe me. So this is something that, uh, that's a sort of uh, proof of concept that you can do. That This is something we would like to try in other settings as well. Um, for example, buildings, I would like to try this out, that can you use artificial observers? It's much quicker than getting people in the room and there's much more flexibility to, to come, up with a, come up with an object that is not, not so visible. And you can turn it around, come up with an object that is like very, very visible. So yeah, that's one thing. Um, the other thing that we are doing is um, uh, virtual reality. Uh, this is not really to do with camouflage. This is, this is more to do with, uh, with visual illusions. So they're building a, a room, they're building a new campus in Bristol. Um, and uh, they're gonna have a room which is, I don't know, meant to be for the story exchange, they call it, people meant to sit down and tell stories. So we recreated this, it's not built yet, I mean, it's nothing there yet, but it, this is how it's gonna look like. There's going to be these, these chairs and we recreated this um, in VR um, and we are asking people to tell us what sort of um, backgrounds they would like and how that affects their physiology. So when, when I say we ask them, sure we ask them verbally that they can say, but at the same time they're also wearing a, um, a sort of scientific Apple watch, I think, it's just it's more accurate, or it's claimed to be more than that, that it measures a lot of physiological recordings, your heart rate, your skin conductivity, etc, etc. Um, so we're trying to correlate that with these experiences. So instead of just asking people in the future, you might be able to just wear something and that can tell us about um, your mood. And as you can guess, what we found is if you show natural stuff, people like it far more than, um, um, than these uh, visual illusions. These are quite, quite difficult. Now, you actually look, it's not upside down. I don't know why there are these things hanging up from the ceiling. You are architects and designers. You might be able to tell me that. Um, that that has nothing to do with our research. It's more to do with the wall, why, why the wall looks like that. Um, and on that note, I'll leave you with a, with a take home message, is whenever you design something, whenever you build something, whenever, always think about who is going to look, look at that and always going to, to try to think that how is the visual system of that thing, because it might be an animal, could be a, could be a non-human animal, um, and obviously with humans as well, there are different visual um, uh, problems that people can have with their acuity, with their color vision and so on. So always think with that, that whatever make, might make sense to you or not make sense to you, it might, make, it might not make sense or make sense uh, to someone else. So yeah, thank you very much.
Um, and just one more thing. This is something we did a few weeks ago. So if you want to try out the glasses with real monkeys, so I got some monkeys that look exactly the same. Um, these are these langurs, but have different color. So you can test against the glasses how they look against uh, sort of a green, green background. Um, and I have a tiger as well, which looks more like a horse. But you, you, get, the, you get the idea of when you wear the glasses. Yeah. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, the short answer to this is I have no idea. And, and, and no, I, I, nobody, nobody does. So we have um, re recently moved to Bristol. Um, Professor Tim Caro used to work in California. Now he's working in, with us in, in Bristol. He's been researching zebras for decades. No idea. No idea. So you, you, you have the zebra. Uh, you have the okapi, who has some stripy, stripy legs. Um, if it's really good in deterring flies, why not uh, uh, cattle and yeah yeah I, I I don't know unfortunately I cannot answer that and as I said I think nobody can as, right now. Hmm. Well, I would yeah certainly I I look at the giraffe and think oh that's pretty pretty nice uh, pretty nice pattern. Um, I don't think anybody looked at uh, horse flies or giraffe flies. I don't know what insect bothers uh, giraffes. Um, I don't think giraffes have been the subject of any experiment that, that pattern uh, yet. So it, it could be. I mean, there are some videos you can look up online. Is, uh, if the giraffe is actually in the forest, it can be pretty well camouflaged, actually. And again, think about who is interested in hunting a giraffe. So uh, the lions and cats in general, they sacrifice their visual acuity. I mean, evolution sacrifice, but cats sacrifice their visual acuity to be more sensitive at night. So the, the, they, the, the more sensors you have in your, in your eyes, the, more, the better visual acuity you have. But it's also your sensors are capturing less light. So if you were happy, if, if you decrease the number of sensors, so they get bigger sensors, your night vision goes up. And that's something that cats, happen, happen to cats, yeah. So I think a, a giraffe would look fairly blurry to a, to a lion. But it's a very different pattern from a zebra then. Yes. I think that's curious that they are so different, but Absolutely. Yeah, so why is the jaguar spotty, a leopard spotty, a tiger stripy, and lion doesn't have anything? And then the mountain, I mean, there are actually like 25, 20 different cat species. There are some smaller ones, which the, the clouded leopard looks incredible. Um, some are stripy like a tiger. Some are, you know, I don't know. This is, this is active research right now. Yes. I wonder if, um, obviously these, that appear on, on animals uh, are dependent to a large extent on the kind of irregularity of them, although there's a kind of system to that irregularity. Mm -hmm. uh, have you looked at that at all? Is there a kind of mechanism? What, what drives pattern generation? Yes, well, in, in the sense that, you know, you could have a zebra that had very neat kind of <laughs> yep. stripes, but in fact they have a kind of, a, a, a kind of organic Yes, yes, yes. So and that, that has a sort of built-in kind of irregularity to it. Is there a sort of, is there a mechanism? Yes, yes. I, I haven't done research on it, but Alan Turing did in the 1950s. Um, after the war, um, he did work on reaction diffusion models. Um, and the idea there was is to have these pigments um, that can sort of interact with each other. They can eat each other and, and, and then grow and, and so on. So you can come up with equations with only two variables, and then here different versions with five variables and so on, that you can generate most patterns that we see in nature using these. And it's been, uh, people did try to look into whether is this actually what's going, I mean, he had the mathematical proof of it. 
But it was not until fairly recently that people looked into, um, I think it's called morphogenesis, it's this pattern generation. Um, and it's, it's the, the research I'm familiar with is done on um, three-spined sticklebacks, so tiny fish that you might come across in, in ponds. Uh, and they were able to show that there is ve something very, very similar um, happening there. So yeah, it's reaction diffusion models if you, if you want to look it up. So they are. Oh, sorry, I just can't see you. There's a massive light, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And the, the ultraviolet part they can see in the flowers. No, no, it's, I mean, we have no idea. So, okay, um, what we can do is do a retinal measurement in most, in most animals. So we can take apart the cat's eye, um, and, or these days you can just do it genetics, you don't actually like tear the eye out. Um, and you can understand what is happening in the retinal level. So what colors your eye as a device is capable of recording. What's happening here, we have no idea, or, very little idea, and for quite a while, I, I think we won't, we won't really know it. So what we can do with the B is, is a fake coloration. So it's, I should have been clearer that the B doesn't see that flower as red or blue. It's just colored for us to, to emphasize uh, that those, what is just yellow for us as a, as a uniform uh, petal is actually quite colorful for the B. That's, that's all fake. You're absolutely right. And that's why it's very, very difficult. It's impossible to do, uh, because very often we use human participants to, to spot things. And we can do it with the dichromat bit, because we can always step down. I can make an image dichromat for you. But I cannot show you truthfully how that monkey would look to a bird, or how that flower would look to a bee. It's, it's, it's impossible, because you just can't, cannot invent an extra color for a human. So what, why I'm hopeful is this artificial observer, the, 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 the the, these algorithms, because I can actually give the algorithm the color channels. I can actually tell the, the algorithm, you're going to have four of these sensors. Um, so now you can evolve. Now, how to, mat how to actually prove that the algorithm does the similar thing that what the bee does or what the bird does is, is a different story. That's, that's hard. But these artificial visual systems might allow us to get insight into that in the near future. Just, just quick, when, you, when you talk about visual acuity, because um, I, I, I do think this is something that relates absolutely to, to architecture and the history of architecture, but I, I think like, you're talking about what you see at a distance. Yes, right? detail, resolving detail, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, you got another question? Um, no, 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 I, I, I haven't heard it in the context of, of females, but I, okay, okay, yeah, it is possible to, to, to have a mutation that causes that, absolutely. So um, mammals, um, or the, the, the ancestors of mammals, which were like reptile-like creatures, they started up with, they were trichromats, dinosaurs were trichromats. Um, lizards, they are trichromats. It's a, dichromacy is very rare every, anywhere else but in, but in mammals. Um, but the theory is that because when the dinosaurs were around, the ancestors of mammals became um, active at night. They, were only, they could only operate at night. So for them it would, it would make sense to lose that extra ch sensor. Now you can have boosted night vision. Um, but some, we re-evolved it relatively recently, 
Uh, we don't know in where exactly happened. We don't even know why it exactly happened. I mean, you can make the argument that uh, spotting a red fruit against uh, a, a green foliage, it's really good to have that, because if you can't see green against, uh, red against green, it's problematic. We don't know exactly why that happens. But it, you can jump up and down. So I heard of mutations that people ended up in an extra color channel. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, praying mantises, this is like a, um, a mantis looking like little creature lives in the ocean, has 12 cones, which is absolutely alien. So it, it has 12, I mean, it's, it's impossible to us to imagine the extra color for the, the birds, the ultraviolet, but imagine you have 12 instead of three. So we do, um, when we look at an object, we tell apart where that, that object from its background primarily based on luminance, not on color. I look at the chair, okay, I can see it's different color from the background, but the, the main thing for me is the luminance difference. And the theory is that for the praying mantis, it does completely based on just color, which, which I can't really conceptualize. Um, but yeah, you can, to answer, sorry, it went pretty far from the extra, uh, extra cone. It is possible. And I think it, did, it does happen, rarely. And obviously, it's much, because females already start up with, th definitely with three, I think. So the likelihood of evolving it, being it evolved in females is, is higher. Structure, yeah. Yeah, so like the peacock, for example. Yes. I was wondering, um, is it that different types of animals see those colors differently, or is it, it does it happen to create the same color for um, all of the types of creatures? Yeah, so I mean, um, because birds see more colors than us. Um, so, um, like, a, like a blue tit, for example, it's, it's already a nice blue, yellow, black and white creature for us, but I think um, for birds, it's even more striking because it can signal in the ultraviolet. I have no idea how a bird sees um, the, the tail of the, of, of, of the peacock, but I'm pretty sure that it's more strike, even more striking um, than, than to us. But as I said, it's very difficult to research that because you just cannot conceptualize it as a human. So I can make statements, yeah, it's probably more striking, but I can't show a truthful picture to you about it. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. 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 I mean, if you have something that could affect animals, so we were just talking about before the talk about wind turbines, for example, um, and they're pretty glossy. I was, in my undergraduate dissertation, I was looking at the gloss perception in bees, and, and what I was, so can they tell apart matte from shiny surfaces? They can. Um, is that, can that glossiness, for example, attract pollinators, insects, to a surface that shouldn't have insects on them, for example, a wind turbine, and then indirectly you know, bring birds and bats and whatever to that wind turbine because they're going for the insects um, and they can get killed, killed by the wind turbine. Um, so I think, we, yeah, if, if, you, if you design something that has certain surface properties, and it, it, it could affect um, wildlife, yes. I think that's, that's, that's a sort of an emerging view that people should think about, and it's kind of my message here as well to, to you to think about it. You had another question there. Sorry. No? Oh, I was just going to Yes, you, you had your hand. So why is it in the source? Why? Oh, uh, so we can see, we, we can perceive stuff that's further away. And, and we can also do it immediately. So sound only works in certain scenarios. But for example, if you consider smell, uh, there is a latency to it. By the time I smell the tiger, if I could, it will already have jump, jumped on me. So, I mean, you know, vision, you can now operate at the speed of light pretty much. I mean, okay, you need a couple hundred milliseconds 
worst to, to, act, to actually process it, but it's a very, very Im immediate, and it goes very far, further than sound. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty, pretty ancient. I think it came around fairly quickly. Um, so we had this Cambrian explosion um, 560 million years ago or, or so on. A lot of different uh, um, animal groups, um, families, and, and, and sort of diverged. Um, and vision was definitely presented that because we can find fossils and see their eyes already. Well, because it, it could be, my, my theory is this um, evolutionary arms race. Now I can see you, but you could actually evolve some. So I have pretty blurry vision to start with because I'm an, I'm an early animal. But I can sort of see stuff around me. Oh, now you can actually evolve something that works really well against that, right? Um, oh, but then there is pressure on me, evolutionary pressure, to evolve better vision. So, and then you evolve better pattern. So you end up in this game, and it can go very quickly and very powerfully. You can end up with quite sophisticated mechanisms, actually, both on the pattern generation side, both on the eye design uh, side. And you've got a question behind. Hmm. I don't know the exact percentage, but we are definitely highly visual creatures. If you look at the brain areas that are involved in vision, um, it's predominantly um, the back of our brain is basically just doing vision. Maybe. That's a very, very good question. And I don't think that's really been answered yet. What effects does it have on, to, on you and, and your development? Um, an area I would recommend looking into, if you're interested in that, is um, color names across the globe. Like, which, 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 um, na which uh, populations could have different color names, uh, more shades. So, I don't know, we have seven, I think, six or seven in English. Um, so uh, I, I know that in, I think in, um, in, in, in Russian there are more for blue and, and so on, so that, that sort of area. Going back to the baby thing about you know, seeing blurry and stuff, but you have to consider that vision is extremely complicated. I mean, to, 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 to get anywhere close to a human with a computer, with the most sophisticated computers on the planet, it's still very, very far. Um, um, so it, there is a calibration period. You, you, you come out with these devices, your eyes, you have all the wiring that goes to your brain area. You, th that, that is getting calibrated. So you don't just come out as a baby and you're ready to do it. As you cannot walk, it's the, it, as, your mu as your muscles need to learn how to operate together. Um, it's, it's exactly the same with vision. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Do you know if there are any um, kinds of clam camouflage that work with um, Thank you. Uh, messing around with stereoscopic sense uh, depth perception that gives something the appearance of being further away or closer than it actually is? Um, there is an idea with the uh, dragonflies is, is